Coming up on this Monday edition of Newsline at noon, a 6.5 magnitude earthquake in China's southwestern province of Yunnan kills at least 367 people and injures nearly 2,000. The death toll from the Ebola outbreak tops 800 as the United States announces plans to send dozens of public health experts to West Africa to help fight the outbreak of the virus. Plus, the Korean economy's dependence on the IT sector keeps growing as companies in the traditionally strong petrochemical, steel and shipbuilding industries fare poorly. These stories are more on Newsline at Noon. It's new Monday, August 4th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in. Live from Seoul, I'm Oh Jin Ju. It's good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Our top story this afternoon, at least 367 people have been killed and almost 2,000 injured after a powerful earthquake struck China's southern Yunnan province on Sunday afternoon local time. The death toll is expected to rise further as officials say many of the wounded are in critical condition and scores more remain missing. Shin Se-min has more. A massive rescue operation continues this Monday to find survivors of a strong quake that struck the densely populated city of Tong in China a day earlier, toppling thousands of buildings and killing at least 360 people. So far, the number of injured stands over 1,800 but is likely to rise. The 6.1 magnitude earthquake had the deepest impact on Ludian, a county of some 449,000 people located in China's southwestern Jiaotong prefecture. An estimated 12,000 homes collapsed there. It is still unknown how many people could still be trapped under the debris. China's state-run Xinhua News Agency says the earthquake was the strongest to hit the region in 14 years. A major rescue and relief operation is underway with over 2,500 officers and soldiers dispatched to the worst hit areas carrying tents, food and excavating tools. The Red Cross Society of China has sent quilts and tents while Red Cross branches in Hong Kong and Macau are also sending relief supplies. Chinese authorities scaled up their disaster response on Monday to the highest national level. Chinese President Xi Jinping ordered authorities to make all-out efforts to save lives, while Premier Li Keqiang ordered them to provide food, clothes and temporary housing for those without shelter. The quake struck in a largely agricultural area that is prone to earthquakes. In 1970, a magnitude 7.7 .7 quake in Yunnan killed at least 15,000 people. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. The deadliest Ebola outbreak on record has health authorities worldwide on edge. The death toll continues to rise and experts now acknowledge the situation has evolved into a crisis that might get out of control. Now, Korea is one of a number of nations taking steps to make sure the virus stays outside its borders. Kwon Sua tells us more. Too fast to get under control. The Ebola outbreak in West Africa, already the deadliest in history, is spreading at a threatening speed in Guinea, Liberia and Sierra Leone. The latest reports show more than 50 people were infected with the virus from July 28th to the 30th. International efforts to contain the virus have accelerated in recent days. African leaders and the World Health Organization are working hand-in-hand -hand on a response plan, while the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has announced it is sending at least 50 experts to the region in the next 30 days. This comes despite two American health workers contracting the virus while helping in the region. Dr. Kent Brantley, who contracted Ebola while treating infected patients in Liberia, was transported to the U.S. for treatment this past weekend. His condition is said to be improving. Another infected aid worker, Nancy Wrightball, is set to return to the U.S. on Tuesday. In Korea, the government held an emergency meeting this Monday to discuss the growing health crisis. There are around 170 Koreans living in the three countries affected the most. 
The health ministry has asked the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to delay the re-entry of Korean citizens traveling home from those affected areas if they show symptoms such as fever and nausea that could be related to the disease. All passengers arriving at Korea's airports are being strictly monitored for any signs as well. The outbreak in West Africa has already killed more than 800 people and has a mortality rate of at least 55 percent. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye has completed her nominations for the new cabinet as she named a mass communications and design expert as her new culture minister on Sunday. The culture minister nominee is Kim Jong-duk, a professor of visual communication design at Seoul's Hongik University. The presidential office cited Kim's experience and expertise in the arts and its leadership as qualities that would help him realize President Park's key state goal of cultural prosperity. Sunday's nomination nomination comes more than two weeks after the president's previous nominee withdrew amid allegations of perjury at his confirmation hearing. As her picks have been made, President Peck is expected to focus on urgent issues that need to be solved, such as pushing for the passage of economy-related bills at the National Assembly. The Korean government says it will publish a white paper on Korean women forced into sexual slavery by Japan before and during World War II by the end of next year. The Ministry of Gender Equality and Family says it will work with the Kumin University Institute of Japanese Studies and the Songgyunggan University Center for East Asian History for this project. The white paper will update an interim report from back in 1992 on the issue and contain new study results and data collected to prove the sexual enslavement of Korean women by the Japanese military. The government plans to translate the white paper into various languages, including English, Chinese and Japanese, to raise international awareness about Japan's wartime atrocities. Korea's main stock index, the benchmark Kospi, shot up to its highest level in three years last week, raising hopes it may be able to break out of its recent pattern of trading in a limited range. But the shifting stock prices show the nation's economy is increasingly dependent on the electronics and IT companies. UDN reports. The benchmark Kospi broke the 2080 mark last week for the first time in three years. But that's not good news for everybody, as data analyzed by corporate tracker CEO Score show that former heavyweights in the traditionally strong petrochemical, steel, and shipbuilding sectors are faring poorly. They used to be among the main building blocks of the Korean economy, but their market cap has slumped in the past three years. Market cap for IT companies, on the other hand, jumped by the biggest margins. Market superstar Samsung Electronics, which take up about 15 percent of overall market capitalization, rose by over 60 percent during the period. And the world's second biggest memory chip maker, SK Hynix, and Korea's leading online portal operator, Naver Corporation, both saw their market cap jump by over 100 percent. But the market value of POSCO, Korea's largest steelmaker, shrank by nearly 27 percent during the period, while that of the world's biggest shipbuilder, Hyundai Heavy Industries, dwindled by over 60 percent. This has naturally led to a shift in the proportion of market cap by each industry. While the IT, automobile, petrochemicals and shipbuilding and steel each took up a similar share of the Cosby market cap back in 2011, the market cap is now mainly led by the IT sector, which accounts for more than a quarter of the overall market. Companies in the petrochemical business saw market cap shrink by over half to 6 percent. Yurian, Arirang News. Now, the stimulus measures recently laid out by the Korean government's new economic team are laser focused on boosting domestic demand and raising household income. But the senior vice president for Moody's Investor Service says structural reforms are the only option to achieve those goals over the long term. Our Hwang Jie this morning spoke with Tom Byrne, who is in charge of credit ratings for the major East Asian economies, including Korea. 
The aggressive fiscal policies of Korea's new economic team will get consumers spending again and help build confidence in business over the short term, says Tom Byrne, a senior analyst at credit rating agency Moody's. He questions, however, whether they will bring about the fundamental changes needed to pull the economy out of its low growth rut. Over the long run, um, I would think that other aspects of the policy package would be more important. In particular, the, uh, the, new, the, the new economic team's uh, focus on economic innovation, such as reducing the debt level of public institutions. There's also um, uh, regulatory reform, I think, is important over the long run, particularly, you know, a, a regime that is, is predictable, uh, less burdensome. Regarding government measures to tax corporate cash reserves, Burns said carrots are better than sticks when it comes to policies. They, they know that they would get a higher return on, an, on a productive investment than they would just by sitting on cash balances. While the new set of economic stimulus comes amid concerns that the Korean economy might follow in the footsteps of Japan's 20 years of lost growth, Burns says Korea is not the only country suffering from the slow growth trap. I think just about every economy is facing the prospects that growth will be slower now than it was before the global financial crisis. About concerns that loosening home loan restrictions could worsen the nation's household debt problem, Byrne believes they aren't warranted for now. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. Now, Korea's largest automotive group is gaining ground around the globe. Hyundai Motor and Kia Motors sold over 2 million vehicles combined during the second quarter of this year. That's good enough for a global market share of 9.1%. That's up 0.8 percentage points from the previous quarter and marks the second highest market share ever for the Korean automakers. The rise is being attributed to new models hitting the market like the Hyundai Sonata and Genesis and an increase in car sales in developing nations. Now, Korea continues to be the nation with the largest income gap between men and women among advanced countries. And what makes this even worse is that it's showing no signs of getting any better. According to data released this Monday by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, Korea's gender income gap in 2012 stood at 37% the highest among 11 countries whose figures were compiled. That means Korean women are paid only 63% of what males earn on average by country. Japan came second with a gender wage gap of 27%, followed by the United States, Canada and the UK. The remaining 23 OECD members have yet to compile their figures. Now, Korea has remained top of this list for 13 straight years now from the year 2000, with the gap only narrowing by three percentage points over that entire period. Now, the summer holiday season is in full swing in Korea. So many Koreans are going abroad to escape the hot and steamy weather we have here right now. And over the weekend, in fact, Incheon International Airport set a new record of visitors going in and out of the country. Our Son Jung-in has this report. It's early in the morning, but the departure gate at Incheon International Airport is already crowded with vacationers leaving the country for their summer holidays. And fortunately for them, strong winds and rain brought by this season's typhoons didn't stop flights operating to their normal schedule. I saw people waiting in long lines at the check-in counter. I couldn't wait that long, so I used the unmanned check-in system. With the summer holiday season in full swing, the number of passengers using Incheon International Airport reached an all-time daily high over the weekend. It recorded a total of 158,000 passengers on Sunday, breaking the previous record of 156,000 set the previous week. Compared to the record daily number of tourists set last year, the figure represents a 10,000 increase. Experts attribute this recent trend to the surge in low-cost carriers and also to the strong local currency. To deal with the growing number of outbound travelers, the airport has stationed six additional security checkpoints and opened its outer parking lot. As the summer peak season continues until mid-August, officials plan to open check-in counters half an hour earlier at 6.30 a.m. We estimate the daily number of passengers from airlines data to better prepare and provide the best service, especially during peak hours. 
Officials advise passport holders to process their documents through the on-man screening system to make the immigration procedure easier and less time-consuming. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now staying on an airport airline related story, the number of low cost carriers in Korea has exploded over the past few years but they've generally kept their services basically rather short haul, up until now at least, because one of them, Jin Air, recently announced that it will start flying quite a bit further than it used to. Uh, Na Hyung Gang explains why. Competition in budget airline market is becoming fierce in Asia, and Korea is no exception. That's why low-cost carriers are looking for a new source of profits, and launching long-haul flight services may be an answer for some, like Jin Air. The low-cost subsidiary of Korean Air is gearing up to offer non-stop flights to Hawaii next year. Budget airlines going long distances is still a difficult nut to crack, but Jin Air's senior vice president of PR, Emily Cho, says it's all about putting passengers at ease over safety issues. Of course, before we can convince them, we have to make sure that our services are ready to deal with the long haul as well. Since it's something new, they have to get used to it. For example, our pilots need 1,000 hours of pre, um, previous experience to even apply to Jin Air, which is the same as Korean Air. So that shows how much we are dedicated to our safety record. Jin Air opened its doors for a business in 2008, and it took two years before it began operating in the black. All five low-cost carriers in Korea, as of last year, are making profits, testimony to the continuing boom of the LCC market in Korea, but there's a catch. Southwest or JetBlue. In the U.S., the main reason why they were able to grow this big is that they were using the minor airports because of cheaper airport fees. But all the airlines are, are focused between Incheon Airport and Kimpo Airport in Seoul, for example. In China and Japan, because the population itself is big enough, there's a lot larger pool of those maintenance people or flight attendants. In order to survive in this very tough market, Cho says Jin Air needs to make its name more known to potential customers overseas. The Korean airlines have a very good reputation among the Chinese people. And we're hoping to kind of bond with them emotionally first. So they want to come to us first instead of us coming to them. The competition in this market will only get worse. And successfully launching flights to Hawaii will be key in locking down sustainable growth for Jin Air. Na Hyun Gyeong, Arirang News. And time now for a look through some of the other international headlines we're following this Monday. For that, we turn to our Eunice Kim standing by at the News Center. Yes, uh, Eunice, a developing story. While most of the world is incensed about yet another horrific attack on civilians in a school in Gaza. Uh, Israel has declared a seven-hour humanitarian ceasefire. That's right, Mark. It's a limited ceasefire that will begin about four hours from now at 10 a.m. local time. The Israeli Defense Forces, or IDF, saying it would hold its fire in most of the Gaza Strip to allow for Palestinians to inspect their homes and humanitarian aid to come in. It warned, though, that it would fight back if attacked, especially as Hamas has said it has not agreed to the humanitarian pause. Also not covered in the seven-hour ceasefire is the southern town of Rafah, where at least 10 people were killed in a shelling at another U.N. school sheltering Palestinian refugees. U.N. Chief Ban Ki-moon condemned the strikes that pounded the school, calling it a moral outrage and a criminal act, while Israel's staunchest ally, the U.S., said it was appalled by the disgraceful attack. Much of Israel's ground troops are reported to have withdrawn to staging areas in Gaza after its struck nearly 70 targets on Sunday and destroyed the last of Hamas's cross-border tunnels. A Gaza health official said more than 50 Palestinians were killed Sunday, including 10 members of a single family. 
Meanwhile, in Iraq, up to 200,000 people have been forced to flee as the Islamic State militants have reportedly taken the town of Shinjar near Syria. That's where the UN says a humanitarian tragedy is unfolding, as a special envoy said many are running to exposed mountains. He expressed grave concern for the lack of basic needs such as food, water, and medicine. Iraqi State TV reported that the militants, formerly known as ISIL, also took control of the Mosul Dam on Sunday, which is Iraq's largest and provides much of the city's power. And a huge landslide swept through northern Nepal early Saturday, and the country's natural disaster department says there is no chance of finding anyone alive under the wave of rock, mud, and debris. It warned there could be more casualties beyond the 159 missing people the department said it had names for. Eight bodies were recovered in the initial rescue stages on Saturday. Rising water levels and mud worsened by Sunday's rains hampered search efforts as troops set off explosives to create a temporary dam to prevent water from flowing to villages downstream. A Manka resident who was injured by the landslide said he feared his entire village had been wiped out. Objective. And finally, Israel had wiretapped the phone of America's top diplomat while he was trying to broker a peace deal between the Jewish state and Palestine, this according to a German weekly. In its report, Der Spiegel said Israeli intelligence agencies listened in on U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry's conversations via satellite and used that information in the negotiations that broke down after nine months in April this year. It added that at least one other spy service monitored Secretary Kerry's calls. No comments so far from Washington or Jerusalem on the matter. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea. Connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah Jin Ju. Even when I'm Ah Jin Ju. Market researcher, strategy analytics said Thursday that LG Electronics brought in about. Now, back to some domestic news now. And still reeling from the effects of one typhoon, the Korean peninsula has only a few days to get ready before the next one makes landfall. Korea's weather agency says typhoon Halong, currently positioned over the Philippines, is moving in a northwesterly direction and could hit Korea's southern island of Jeju by this weekend. Halong, recently upgraded to a typhoon, is packing winds as strong as 250 kilometers an hour and uh, could also have an effect on, on southern Japan. It's the Northwest Pacific's third super typhoon of the year and follows Typhoon Nakuri, which hit Korea's southern peninsula on Sunday. And uh, over the weekend, at least seven people in the eastern province of Gyeongsangbukdo were killed as a result of that typhoon, and several buildings were also damaged. Now, there are a few things more satisfying on a hot summer's day than uh, going inside and just flopping in front of an air conditioner on full power to cool down. But that comfort could actually be coming at a price to your health. Our Kim Young Bin explains why. Lee Jae-ho paid a visit to the doctor a couple weeks ago because he had lost his appetite and began to sweat more than he normally did, even while in cool places. I had headaches, a fever, and was coughing a lot. I was in a bad state. To his surprise, the doctor told him he had pneumonia. Pneumonia typically occurs during winter months, but can also strike in the summer. Data from a local hospital shows that the number of patients diagnosed with the lung infection during the months of July and August is nearly 70 percent of mid-winter figures. Doctors say that when summer heat reaches its peak, the immune system can weaken. The frequent use of air conditioning can also lead to respiratory problems due to a greater exposure to bacteria. When it is humid, like in monsoon season, your lungs become weaker and cannot properly emit the germs that enter your body. High temperatures can also raise the risk of strokes. The number of stroke patients surpassed the 1.9 million mark in both July and August last year, figures that are similar to those seen in winter. This is because the stress caused by prolonged exposure to heat can increase blood pressure. 
which is bad news for sufferers of diabetes and high blood pressure. When you are exposed to the heat for a long period of time, you can get dehydrated, which can affect cerebral blood flow. Doctors recommend drinking plenty of water and to cut back on coffee and alcohol, which may cause dehydration. Regular exercise and seven to eight hours sleep can also ensure that your immune system remains strong during the dog days of summer. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Good afternoon. Well, Typhoon Nakuri dissipated yesterday, but we'll have lingering showers across the nation today. 5 to 20 millimeters are expected for the upper provinces, while the southern regions and Jeju should see 10 to 40 millimeters. And humidity levels will remain high at about 90 percent here in the capital under mostly cloudy skies. So it's going to be a humid day today, and the high in Seoul will rise to 30, while Daegu will climb to 31, and Gwangju and Busan will have daily highs of 28 this afternoon. And for other regions, it looks like Jeju Island and Daejeon will top out at 32 and 28, and Dukdo should reach 27. And as Mark mentioned a few minutes ago, another typhoon is on the way. Typhoon Halong will start to have an effect on the peninsula at the end of the week, and it's likely to hit the southern regions the most. And as for here in Seoul, no significant rain is in store until Thursday this week, but things could change as it all depends on the pass of Typhoon Halong. Well, that's all for me today. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Well, thank you, Jian. And those are the stories we're following at this hour. Jinju and I will be back at the same time on Tuesday. Until then, goodbye.